going to read this creed, which is universally accepted amongst uh, Trinitarian Christians, um, amongst the uh, Roman Catholic, the Eastern Orthodox, as well as Protestants. All of them affirm uh, this creed. Uh, and like I said, there's, uh, we only have now less than an hour, so there's no time to get into like the history of Christian, especially the first three centuries, um, and not a lot of time to get into um, refutations and things like that, but we are going to simply read these creeds and do a little bit of commentary on them. It's very important for us to understand exactly what Christians believe uh, so that we don't uh, assume uh, incorrect things and then simply build straw men. Um, so, beginning with this uh, creed here, this is the creed that was, like I said, ratified 325 of the Common Era after the Council of Nicaea. This was the first ever ecumenical church council, the creedal exposition of the faith by the 318 fathers who are the church, uh, the church bishops, the Christian bishops that attended the council. So, the bishops uh, begin by saying, we believe in one God, uh, the Greek says, and the, this, the Greek is the original, pistia amen, eis henatheon patera pantokratora. So we believe in one God, the Father, who is the creator of all. Uh, in the Latin translation, if you'll notice, the word is omnipotentum, which means the omnipotent. It continues, the maker of all things, seen and unseen. And we believe in one, and the word here is kurian, which is translated as Lord. The word kurian is a bit ambiguous. It's used in the New Testament uh, for uh, God, but also for human beings. Uh, the word kurian could mean master or teacher or even rabbi. Certainly here in the Nicene Creed, the authors of the creed meant it uh, as a way of saying God, uh, and we'll see that uh, in a minute. But this is a common juxtaposition you'll find in Christian literature of God, the Father, and the Lord, Jesus Christ. This is a juxtaposition you find in the Pauline epistles uh, in the New Testament, letters written by Paul, where, where God equals the Father and the Lord is Jesus Christ. And Paul actually most likely meant uh, this juxtaposition as a way of demonstrating that they are actually unequal, that they're not the same that Jesus is not, or Jesus Christ is not equal uh, to God, uh, but is uh, somehow um, divine nonetheless. It's very difficult to wrap our hands around exactly what Paul is saying about Jesus. What exactly is his Christology? Is he saying that Jesus is not God? Is he saying that he is God in some, some way, but it's a limited way? Or is he saying that he is, in fact, God and he's the same essence as uh, the Father? There's different ways of reading uh, Paul. But here in the, the Nicene Creed, uh, God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ are, or will be, you'll see, uh, equalized explicitly. So this is what Christians believe. Christians believe that uh, the Son of God is God, essentially. So he continues here. They continue saying in the Creed, Theu, the Son of God, Genethenta uh, ectu patros monogene in the Greek, uh, which means um, this is from, meaning the Son is from the essence, the essence of uh, the Father. The, the word here for essence, usias, is not a biblical term, uh, but it's the word that the early church fathers uh, use to denote God's essence, right? So when we talk about Trinitarian theology, we're talking about one essence of God, right? God is one essence, but he has three persons, three particulars. One usia, that is shared by three hypostases, and those are the Greek terms. If we were to translate that into English, one essence or one nature that is shared uh, by three uh, separate and distinct persons, right? So it's important for us to get uh, this distinction between nature or essence and person, or you can say uh, universal and particular, right? So, for example, let's imagine that um, there are only three species of shark, right? There's a great white shark, there's a hammerhead shark, and there's a tiger shark. So, all three of them are essentially shark. Even though the great white shark doesn't have a head like a hammer, it doesn't make him any less shark. 
nothing of his sharkness is deprived, um, right, by not having a hammer head. He is 100% shark. So all three are shark, 100% in essence, but they are also three particulars who are different, right? So the three persons of the Trinity are not the same person. They're three separate persons, three separate particulars, but they share the same essence, right? So that's, that's an important uh, distinction. But going on here, uh, they continue to... Uh, as we said, begotten of the Father uniquely. This is from the essence of the Father. And then they go on to describe who is the Son of God, right? Because the issue at Nicaea was uh, the Son of God. Who is the Son of God? Is the Son of God somehow ontologically inferior to God the Father? Or is he God the Father? So, there are two camps represented at the Council of Nicaea. Again, this is the first ever uh, ecumenical church council held in the early 4th century. Now, mind you, by this time, um, there were no more, you know, what, what are known as Judaizers or, or Jewish Christians. You know, the first Christians, um, they were uh, not Christians at all. They were actually a sect of Judaism who happened to believe that Isa alayhi salam, uh, was the Messiah uh, in some sense and that he was a prophet. And there's different names that, that are given in early literature for this group, one of the names is the Nutsrim, which is Hebrew, the Nazarenes, and it seems like the Quranic epithet for Christians and Nasara is related to the the word Nutsrim. And why they call the Nazarenes is because Isa alayhi salam was raised in a city called Nazareth, which is in the north of Palestine, in the province called Galilee. Um, the early Christians were also called Evyonim. Um, which uh, means something like the spiritual paupers or the poor people. Um, but nonetheless, uh, so here in the creed we have uh, that, so basically what I was, I kind of lost my trail of thought there. At the Council of Nicaea, you don't have uh, Ebionite or Nazarene representations of Christians that have some authority in the empire uh, that have difference of opinion regarding the ontological status of the Son of God. On one side, you have Arius of Alexandria, who did not believe that, um, that the Son of God was divine in the sense that he was equal to God the Father. Now, there's a lot of speculation about Arian Christology. Uh, we don't really know what Arius really believed about the Son of God. But it appears as if Arius believed that the Son of God was a created entity and totally ontologically, that is to say, essentially inferior to God the Father. So he's representing one side. And then you have Athanasius on the other side, um, who is representing the position that the Son of God is in fact God the Son right, that the Father and the Son are equal, essentially. And then they took a vote at the Council of Nicaea, a very democratic process, that indeed the vote favored the latter position of Athens, and so the Son of God officially became uh, God the Son. Uh, and of course, Christ believe that whatever uh, dogma is hammered out or is produced at these ecumenical church councils, and I, of course, nice being the first one, whatever dogma comes out of these councils, considered to be actually infallible, right? And binding up people believe in. It's now, every Christian has to believe that the Son of God is equal to God the Father. Since so we have this statement here in the Nicene Creed, about the Son of God that says, Ekfeu, God from God, Phos Ekphotas, light from light, you know, Theon Aleithinon Ek Aleithinu, right? You guys see that true God from true God. And then that fame, Genethenta Upoi Athenta, begotten, not made. What does that mean, begotten, not made? So again, here at Fathers, uh, the bishops are talking about the Son of God, that he's begotten. What does it mean? What do they mean by begotten? 
Well, here they don't mean anything physical. They mean generated or caused naturally that the Son of God uh, was caused by the Father, right? So they, they freely say that the Son is the effect and the, cause, and the Father is the cause. Now, logically speaking, an effect is always after the cause, right? Um, in earthly relationships, the Son is always after the Father in temporality because the Father causes the Son. Trinitarian exegetes, Trinitarian theologians, they say uh, that there is um, no time between the Father and the Son. That even though the Father is these of the Son, the Father does not have a temporal precedence over the Son. Why? Because the Son was begotten, the Father was caused or generated in pre eternality. Right before time, right. So the father does not have temporal uh, precedence uh, over the son, nor does the father have ontological superiority over the son. Why? Because when the father generated the son, or when the father caused the son, and they use that word begotten, when the father begot the son in pre-eternality. The Father begot the Son from his own essence, from his own us, that term again, essence or substance. So then the Son is exactly equal to the Father, even though the Son is caused by the Father. And this is a, a bit of a, a, a paradox um, in their theology. So, but this is something they believe in. Begotten, not made, means the Son is caused naturally. The Son was not willed into existence. This is not a Trinitarian belief. In other words, because when God wills something into his existence, it means that uh, uh, this thing was created by God, right? Um, so, for example, in Arabic, the word sha'a, the verb, verb sha'a yasha'u, is related to the noun. Right, Lisa Kimithlihi Shay. A Shay is something that is willed into existence, right? The word sh is related to the word will. Um, but for Christians, the Son of God is not willed into existence. In other words, he's not created, right? Um, so it's not like uh, in Judaism where, or in Islam where everything other than God is willed into existence because it is created. In Trinitarian theology, the Son of God um, is not willed to exist. He always existed, right? It is just part of the nature of God, they say, to be a father, right? There was never a time when he was not a father. Um, uh, Arius actually had the position, you know, the position that was defeated at Nicaea. He called the Son of God by the Greek katisma teleon, which means the best of creation. So it seems, again, we don't really know exactly, but it seems like the position of Arius, that was who was defeated at the Council of Nicaea by Athanasius and the Proto-Trinitarians, it seems like his position was that the Son of God was in fact created and willed into existence. So that's the uh, the, the Neoplatonists, and uh, I recommend people, uh, you know, uh, um, conduct further research and studies into early Christian origins and the uh, incredible influence of a philosophy known as Neoplatonism uh, upon the early Trinitarian uh, thinkers. Um, there are certainly very clear parallels between uh, Plotinus's thinking, the founder, if you will, of Neoplatonism, and the early uh, Trinitarian. Uh, theologians, especially the Cappadocians and Athanasius and uh, Augustine of Hippo. But the one point of difference between uh, Trinitarian theology and Neoplatonic theology, if you will, is that the Neoplatonists, they said that the second emanation of God that they call the Logos, right, the Word, um, was the result of a sort of involuntary spillage of light um, without really God's concern. Um, so the, the Christian position is certainly not that. Uh, in other words, the son was not caused by the father due to some involuntary emanation. 
Um, and at the same time, the son was not caused by the father uh, through an act of will. In other words, the son is not created, right? Both of these positions, the what, what you can say sort of the Jewish position as well as a Neoplatonic position uh, with respect to the quote-unquote origins of the son are rejected by Christians. Um, their position is that uh, the son uh, always existed and that God is just naturally a father and he always was a father. And even though the father caused the son, um, there was never a time when the, when the father existed and the son uh, did not because the father begot the son in pre-eternality from his own essence. I know that's a bit confusing, but watch this over again and meditate on it, <laughs> inshallah, uh, and it'll sink in a bit more. Um, if you're interested in a quick sort of a great book on this that's short and, and doable is Tarmotum, T-O-O-M, Tarmotum, Classical Trinitarian Theology, an excellent resource. But continuing here, um, so God from God, so they're, again, they're talking about the Son of God here, is God from God, light from light, true God from true God, and then that famous phrase, begotten, not made. So again, begotten, not made. What does that mean? It means that he was caused, not created, right? The Son of God is uncreated. Here we're talking about the Son of God, um, in the sort of celestial realm of things, or what you might say, um, in the in the world of universals, as someone like Plato might have said, we're not talking about the physical body of Jesus Christ. Obviously, that was created, that was flesh and blood. So that's a separate issue. We're not saying that Jesus Christ, as a, as a man, is uncreated. That's not what Christians believe. The body of Jesus Christ, the flesh and blood, is certainly created. We're talking about the essence that incarnated into the flesh. Um, um, you know, if you studied Platonic metaphysics, Plato has this idea of, it, of the divided line, that everything above the line is in the world of universals and particulars and immutables, and everything below the line is particular and created and mutable, right? So, the body of Christ, the physical body of Christ, is below Plato's divided line. It's certainly flesh and blood. It's mutable. It aged, right? Um, it could be hurt, um, but his essence is from uh, the celestial realm. Um, okay. And then you have this very uh, important term here in the creed. Uh, the Greek is hamausion, but I've translated it as co-substantial. Hamausion to patri, co-substantial with the Father. So what does hamausion mean? Again, this term is not biblical. You won't find it in the New Testament. So these are sort of Greek philosophical terms um, that were used uh, by the Proto-Orthodox Church Fathers in order, uh, for, uh, according to them, as as articulating what they believe to be true about what the New Testament is teaching. So homoousion Christology, right? This is the position of Trinitarians, right? It literally means I mean, same, and then usian or usias, there, there's that term, essence, same essence Christology, you know, comes from Christos and Lagos, um, basically belief about Christ. So, homo usian Christology is basically this belief that the, the Son of God um, is of the same exact essence as the Father, right? Um, and there are different types of Christologies. You also have something called Hamoi Usian, which looks the same as ha Hama Usias, but there's an iota in there, the Greek letter iota, that makes a world of difference, uh, which Hamoi Usian Christology means uh, similar essence. So not quite, the, uh, but um, somehow less. There's then sort of a privation of perfection, but still possibly a divine being. So that's that's not the position of the of the uh, Trinitarians. And then of course you have heterousian, hetero, right? Hetero means other, other essence Christology. This is the position of Arius. This is a position of like Jews, right? When it comes to uh, the Messiah, although Jews don't believe that. 
uh, Isa alayhi salam was the Messiah. Uh, they believe the Messiah is yet to come, but the Jews do not believe that the Messiah will be a divine being, right? The Messiah's essence is other than that of God. The Messiah will be created. What's going on here with, these, with the internet connection? Okay, so to continue, we were talking about co-substantial with the Father, through whom all things in heaven and earth became. Uh, so this is the Christian position that all things were created through the word of God, through the logos. By the way, logos or word of God is another way of saying the son of God, right? Those two terms are interchangeable. Uh, and then he says, or they say, the one, meaning the son, who for the sake of us human beings and for the sake of our salvation came down and became flesh and dwelled in man, right? So here the term um, enanthropesanta, right? Uh, in, the, in the Latin, incarnatus est, right? Incarnation. So in obviously means in, and then carne in Latin means meat or flesh. So became flesh. So this is a Christian belief now that the second person of the Trinity, right? The son of God, also called the Logos, the one who was caused, that is to say, begotten from the essence of the Father before time, at some point in history, came down into, uh, hu uh, into, into his creation and assumed human flesh, right, as Jesus of Nazareth, as Isa alayhi salam, um, according to uh, the Christians. And he says here again, uh, the one for who uh, the sake for the sake of us human beings and for the sake of our salvation came down and became flesh and dwelled in man, right? Uh, suffered and rose on the third day. So the question is, why did God become a man? Um, you know, this is a belief that obviously we would repudiate, not only us. Uh, this is a belief that Jews uh, find absolutely blasphemous. And it's very interesting that Christians believe that their theology can be grounded in the Old Testament. Of course, the term Old Testament is also Christian terminology. You know, Jews don't like the term Old Testament. It implies that their scripture is superseded or abrogated. Uh, and in fact, it is from our position. Um, but um, the term that they prefer, that Jews prefer, is Tanakh. And in the Tanakh, or the, we can say, Hebrew Bible, you can even call it the Torah if you want, but I'll call it the Tanakh. In the Tanakh, it's very, very clear uh, in several places that God is not a man, right? Just to give you one quick reference, Numbers 23, 19. So the book of Numbers is in the first five books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. So it's the fourth book of the Pentateuch, the fourth book of the Torah, what Jews and Christians believe was revealed to Musa alayhi salam. Uh, there's a lot of questionable things in the Pentateuch from our perspective, Allahu alam. Uh, but Numbers 23, 19 is just, there's a, there's a three word phrase there, lo ish el, which is Hebrew, which means God is not a man, right? God is not a man. So this idea that this Christian idea that is laid out here in the in the Nicene Creed that God uh, incarnated into human flesh um, is uh, absolutely um, uh, considered to be uh, blasphemy according to uh, Jewish authorities, um, according to Jewish theology. But why did God have to do that from the Christian perspective? Well, according to the Christians, um, the old covenant, right? That the Mosaic covenant, that if you obey God and fulfill his commandments, then he will forgive you. God, in effect, changed his mind uh, and decided to go with a new covenant. And the new covenant was quite radically different than the old one. Um, and this is something that is mentioned by Paul. So. Um, this is very important that I would say that probably the principal founder of Trinitarian Christianity uh, is, in fact, Paul. Uh, most of Christianity, as we know it, is based on the teachings and writings 
of Paul and not the teachings of Isa alayhi salam, not even the teachings of Isa alayhi salam according to the four canonical gospels. So this idea of a savior man god, a dying and rising savior man god, right? This was a very prevalent belief in the ancient Near East, in the Mediterranean, around the time of Paul. Um, uh, so this is uh, this appears to be a a motif that he incorporated in order to explain what he considered to be the message of Isa alayhi salam, that now we need a savior to die for our sins. And that's the only way to sort of reconcile ourselves um, to uh, to God. Yeah, and uh, set, yeah, there's a there's a good book. There's a, there's a comment here in the chat box. There's a book by Kersey Graves, and there's some historical issues with this text. It's an old text, but it's called the world the world sixteen crucified saviors. And in this text, he goes on to document how this idea, this motif of a dying and rising savior man-god is quite common um, in the ancient world, right? Um, you, you see it in, in several countries um, around the world. Um, and what, what Paul did basically is that he gave it sort of a Jewish makeover. And again, he, Paul uses it to explain what he believes to be the gospel, right? Um, so before Christianity, you had, you know, Osiris, um, a, a deity who was worshipped in Egypt. You have Adonis in Syria. You have Romulus in Rome, Zalmoxis in, in Thrace, uh, Inanna, an ancient Sumerian uh, goddess, Mithras, the Persian uh, uh, sun god. Um, all of these were considered savior gods. All of them were called the sons of God, not the God, but the son of God. So these religions were all sort of henotheistic, right? They believed in the multiplicity of gods, but there was sort of one major God. Um, all of these uh, gods under, underwent some sort of uh, a passion. Um, all of them obtained victory over death. Um, so this idea of a dying and rising savior man God, this is not something new. This is a recycled mythos that Paul incorporates into his understanding uh, of, of the gospel, right? وَقَالَتِ النَّصَارَ مَسِيحُ بْنُ اللَّهِ That the Christians say that the Christ is the son of God. Of the son of God. ذَلِكَ قَوْلَهُمْ بِأَفْوَاهِهِمْ يُضَاهِئُونَ قَوْلَ الَّذِينَ كَفُرُوا مِنْ قَبْلِ Right? This is something that they utter with their mouths. In this, they but imitate what the unbelievers of old used to say. This is just a recycled mythos. You see, Hellenistic uh, religion Greco-Roman religion tended to be syncretistic. It would take elements from different religions. They would mix and match different elements. So for example, the cult of Mithras, the Persian sun god, is really an amalgamation of, of Hellenistic and Persian elements. The cult of Dionysus was an amalgamation of Hellenistic and Phoenician elements. So Pauline Christianity is really an amalgamation of Hellenistic, Greek, and Jewish beliefs, creating a new hybrid religion called Christianity, right? So certainly this idea of a, um, of a incarnating savior man God dying for the sins of humanity, this has nothing to do with Judaism. This is held in anathema by, by Jewish authorities. I mean, it's, it's kofor to the 10th degree, right? God becoming flesh. The Messiah was uh, divine. He was God. And then he kills himself essentially for the sins of mankind that God can die. Um, very, very strange um, for, for, for Jews. And this is why essentially, this is essentially why most Jews um, in the late first century and going into the early second century, the vast, vast majority of Jews did not become a Christian uh, because by that time, uh, um, Pauline influence had infiltrated so many of the, uh, the church congregations around the ancient Near East uh, that it's just impossible for a Jew to accept that another Jew was God and that God died, right? It's just impossible. It's inconceivable for a Jew to accept that. Um, <clears throat> okay. 
And then he continues to say, they continue to say, suffered and rose on the third day, ascended into heaven, uh, and will come to judge the living and the dead. So here we have what's known as a reference to the parousia, uh, the second coming of Jesus. Um, so here's the sort of Jewish argument. The Jews have all of these prophecies in the Hebrew Bible about what they believe to be the coming of the future Davidic king, Messiah, that this Messiah will have power on the earth, that he will, um, he will gather the, uh, the remnant of Israel and Judah and gather them back into Palestine, uh, that uh, he will uh, basically be the king of the world, he will spread knowledge to every nation, he will have earthly dominion, um, uh, he will be from the seed of David, and he will rebuild the temple, right? And uh, Isa alayhi salam did none of these things. Uh, so the Jewish response is, well, he can't be the Messiah, right? So the Christian response is, well, he's going to do those things, but he's going to do them in the second coming. Now, what is the Muslim position? Because the Muslims call, the Quran calls Isa alayhi salam al-Masih which means the Messiah. However, I would argue that this whole idea of a Davidic king Messiah to come at the end of time who's going to rule the world, this is a, this is a fabrication in the Old Testament. All of those texts that talk about a coming future Davidic Messiah, they're either talking about Hezekiah, which was an ancient Jewish king, um, or another king, or their fabrications that were written during the exilic or post-exilic period that simply did not come true, which exposes them as false. But that's a different, that's a different story. But just to say for now that, that, um, that Christians believe in the second coming of Isa alayhi salam. And then at the very end of this paragraph, they say, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. So they threw in the Holy Spirit at the end here. Again, this council of Nicaea is not really dealing with the Holy Spirit at all. That's not going to come until the next ecumenical church council in 381 of the Common Era. But for now, in 325, the issue is, who is the Son of God? And then there's a second paragraph here in the Nicene Creed that says, and those who say, and the Greek says, ein pate hate uk ein, there was a time when he was not. Right. So now the, the, um, the proto Trinitarian bishops are quoting their theological opponents. Who are they? The Arians who took the position that there was a time when the sun did not exist. The S O N, the son of God did not exist. Right. Ain pate hate uk ain. There was once when he did not exist. In other words, the Arians appeared to have said that the sun does not have essential pre eternality, that the sun is is inferior to the Father in his essence. And before being begotten, before being caused, he was not, that's also the Aryan position, and that out of non-being he became, right? So the, the Trinitarians here are saying, or at least the proto-Trinitarians are saying, that anyone who says that the Son of God um, came out or was caused by non-being, in other words, ex nihilo, that the Son of God was created out of nothing, that person who says that, according to the creed, is uh, accursed and anathematized is the actual Greek term. Anyone who says the Son of God is created, changeable, or alterable, all uh, um, these people we consider to be uh, accursed and anathematized. So in other words, they're pronouncing takfir upon those who say that the Son of God is is created ex nihilo. He's created out of nothing, right? Um, so that's that's the Nicene Creed. Now, the second part here is a a slight revision of the Nicene Creed. It's called the Nicio Constantinopolitan Creed uh, that was ratified three eighty one of the Common Era. And if you look at that creed here. Um, and this was, again, 381, the emperor was Theodosius, 150 church fathers. It's basically the same as the Nicene Creed, but they did add a few things. And so now this is the first true Trinitarian creed right here. The Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed of 381 is the first true, because all three principles, 
all, all three persons of the Trinity now are dealt with, the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So, you can see the Trinity did not crystallize into what it is today until 381 of the Common Era. That's a long time, right? Um, so, what did Christians believe in the second century? What did they believe in the first century? According to historians, as I said, the first Christians were not actually called Christians. They were Jews, but they happened to believe in the messiahship of Isa alayhi salam. They were Jews. They followed the mitzvot, the Jewish law. They worshipped in the synagogues, right? They kept the kosher laws. They were completely outwardly and inwardly Jews. The only difference is that they believed that Isa alayhi salam was the messiah. Um, so, we've gone from that now to 381 BCE, uh, sorry, 381 of the Common Era, where um, you have uh, three persons of a Godhead, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So, this creed begins the same way as the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the creator of all, the maker of heaven and earth, and all things seen and unseen. That's the same language as Nicaea. And we believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, unique Son of God. They did add this thing here, the one begotten from the Father before the ages. So that's new that they modified here in the, in the Creed of 381. The one begotten, the one generated or caused from the Father before all the ages. So here they're not saying, uh, they're, not, they're not stressing uh, simply the, the, the pre-eternality of the Son, right? I mean, that could probably be, that, that was probably the Aryan position. In other words, the Son of God was created before time, but he's still created. He just happens to be the first thing created. So he's pre temporal, but that, that does not mean he's pre eternal. He doesn't have a divine attribute. In other words, he still possibly could not have existed, right? The one who has pre eternality has necessary existence, right? That's, that's God, that's Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that would be the Father in heaven, to use the Christian terminology. Um, the Aryan position appears to have been that the Son of God is pre-temporal, he's before time, but he's still created, okay? Whereas the Trinitarian position is that the Son is pre-eternal. He always existed, um, um, and he is essentially pre-eternal. So he's not a possible being. He's a necessary being. He's not from the mumkinat, as we would say in Islamic theology, that he, his existence is wajib, 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 wajib wujud. He has necessary existence. And that's what they're saying here, the church fathers in 381, that the, the son shares an essential pre-eternality with the father. Right? He's not a possible being. He's a necessary being. Um, and then again, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, co-substantial with the Father, through whom all things became, the one for the sake of us human beings and for the sake of our salvation came down from the heavens and became flesh. So far, it's the same as Nicaea. And then we have uh, an addition, by the Holy Spirit and Mary the Virgin. Right? So that's something new. We didn't see that in Nicaea by the Holy Spirit, so he became, uh, he became flesh by the Holy Spirit and married. These are sort of, you know, Jesus's quote-unquote parents, uh, if you will. So, Mary is mentioned explicitly, and of course, the status of Mary, the status of Maryam alayhi salam, keeps climbing over the ages. By the, by the time we get to the Council of Ephesus, which is the third ecumenical church council after this Council of Constantinople, the Council of Ephesus held in 431, Mary is given the title of Theotokos, which is sometimes translated as Mother of God, but that's not a good translation, rather the carrier or bearer of God, right? One who handles God, uh, if you will. And then over the years in the 20th century, uh, Mary was um, uh, given other types of statuses, uh, the Vatican uh, declared that Mary was uh, immaculately conceived, she didn't have original sin, and that she was assumed into heaven, that she didn't actually, um, she didn't actually die or suffer a physical death, but she was assumed body and spirit into heaven. Um, so, those are, those are much later beliefs. 
Um, okay, continuing then. And then they say here in this updated creed um, that he was crucified for our sake under Pontius Pilate, right? So what did we get in the Nicene Creed? We simply got the statement. What did they say here? Um, let me see if I can. They, they just say, oh, pathanta. Pathanta, just one word. He suffered. He suffered, right? And rose on the third day. So that's a bit vague. What do you mean he suffered? How did he suffer? So here in the Niceno Constantinopolitan Creed, the bishops are much more clear and they say that he was crucified, right? Crucified here. Um, the term here, uh, yeah, staurothenta, right? He was put on a stauros, which is like a pole or a stake. It doesn't really mean cross, uh, but that's usually how it's translated. Um, that he was crucified for our sake under Pontius Pilate, the Epipontiu Pilatu. Who was Pontius Pilate? Well, he was the Roman governor of Judea at the time. So why do the bishops mention these details in 381? Well, it seems like they want to situate uh, Jesus historically, right? They want to say that he was really crucified. It's historical, right? It's not a myth or a rumor or something like that. Uh, that he was actually crucified, and this was the Roman governor at the time, and he's a historical person. So Jesus was, in fact, a historical person. And then he continues, and suffered and was buried. So that's something new. They mention here in this creed that he was buried. Um, it doesn't mention that. The bishops don't mention that in 325 of the Nicene Creed. Uh, so what they mean to say here is that it was an actual body, right? Because you have different types of Christologies in the first three centuries that the Proto-Orthodox did not find to be uh, kosher, if you will, um, or acceptable. Uh, for example, there was something called literal docetism, right? So the docetists were a group of Christians, and there's different groups of them, that believed that something else sort of happened to Jesus at the end of his life, right? They're called the docete. So, dokeo, it comes from the Greek dokeo, which means to seem or to appear. We saw something in appearance, but that's not what really happened, right? They're called the literal docetists. And this takes on many forms. One form is called docetic Gnosticism, right? So, there were a group of Christians early on who believed that Isa a.s. didn't actually have a physical body. There was no flesh and blood Jesus, that he was a phantasm, that he was sort of a thick ghost. He appeared to people like he had a physical body, but he wasn't actually a physical body because they believed that Jesus was totally God. There was nothing human about him. So, and, and matter, uh, you know, is something that is, uh, that is just, um, it's 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 uh it's it's changeable it's it's you know it's uh it's it's part of the earth and uh it, it's just a low material matter is just low so god cannot be matter he just appeared to be matter so that was the position of the docetic gnostics that he was a phantasm so really the what was crucified was not a person at all was not a body at all it was just an illusion there was another type of uh, docetic belief called uh, docetic substitutionism. Now, the docetic substitutionists, like Basilides, who lived in the second century, his position is that Isa a.s. did have a physical body, but his body was not the one crucified, that someone else was substituted in his place. This is a Christian belief um, that was apparently pretty widespread at the time, even, you can argue, even before the time of the composition of the Gospel of John, which was at the end of the first century. So, this is a first century Christian belief that someone else was crucified instead of Isa a.s. And then you have something called docetic separationism. So, this is also an early belief that espoused this idea that uh, Isa a.s. was God and man, but his divine nature was able to detangle itself 
from the human body of Jesus, leaving only a human body and a human person of Jesus to die on the cross, while his uh, divine nature or divine person exited his body, right? So we have that famous cry of dereliction, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? That's mentioned by Mark and Matthew. They say that when Jesus was on the cross, he cried out to God, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Right? And the uh, early docetic separationists, they said, well, this is because the divine person of God had left, separated himself from the body of, of Christ. Um, so, so they're, they're, they're emphasizing here, he was buried. There was a body that was buried, right? <laughs> and rose on the third day, according to the scriptures. That's something new also in this creed of 381. We didn't see that in the Nicene Creed. That here, um, the Christian bishops want to tell us that this whole idea of God becoming man and, and, and uh, dying, suffering for our sins, and then resurrecting, uh, this is something that is fulfilled. This is a fulfillment of scripture. This is the claim uh, of the Christians. Uh, and there are different uh, passages that the New Testament authors will cite, for example, Psalm 22, Isaiah chapter 53, which is uh, probably uh, the quintessential um, prophecy of the Christian version of, of Jesus, Isaiah's uh, suffering servant that's quoted all the time. The Gospel of John quotes it. The book of Acts, who is Luke, he quotes it. Um, uh, Paul in Romans, he, he quotes it as well, right? So here, the, the church fathers are trying to trying to tell us that this is not some foreign idea that comes from, you know, uh, a foreign place. The idea of God becoming man and suffering and dying and resurrecting, this is an idea that is found in the scriptures, they're saying, right? According to the scriptures is the term uh, that they're using here, katatas grafas, that which is written. And the scriptures that they're referring, referring to is the Hebrew Bible right? Um, so, the Christians have the <laughs> difficult task of trying to prove their theology through the Hebrew Bible, and I think it is quite a difficult task. I'll give you a, an example. Um, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 3, verse 17, it says that you shall not drink blood, and this is an everlasting statute, right? This is a statute, a law that is never going to be canceled right? Um, do not drink blood, right? Uh, Leviticus 3.17. Now, Christians believe that, um, that in order to properly commemorate the sacrifice of Jesus, um, one must participate in something called the Eucharist, which is one of the seven sacraments. What is the Eucharist? Well, this is when bread and wine are presented on the altar on Sunday, and Catholics believe that, and every Christian used to be Catholic. Now there are about a billion Catholics. I think they're the, they're, yeah, they're the largest denomination. The Catholics believe that the Holy Spirit descends at Mass on Sunday and will transform the accidents of the wine into the literal blood of Jesus. This is literal according to the Catholics. It's not figurative. It literally becomes the blood of Jesus. Now, you might say, well, it still looks and smells like wine. That's true, right? Um, the accidents remain wine. The essence has changed. It's called, it's called transubstantiation. That's the actual term for it. The essence of the wine has become the blood of Jesus, but the accidents remain wine. So, it still smells like wine. It tastes like wine. It feels like wine. But the essence is actually the blood of Jesus, right? Uh, so that's an example. I mean, how do you square that with Leviticus chapter 3? Um, I'm, I'm out of time, actually. I don't know if uh, we can do a little bit Guys, more. You, you can keep going, inshallah, because we started a little bit late and we have the interruption. So please go ahead. Okay, inshallah. Just let me know when uh, um, you want me to make a hard stop, inshallah. And again, if people have questions, they can or clarifications, they can type it into the chat box or just start speaking. It's okay if you interrupt me. Um, I don't know what's going on. I can't see anyone's faces. Usually when I give a lecture, 
to students, I can tell if people are following me, if people are falling asleep, and people are confused, but I can't see any faces. Um, so actually, there are a few questions. Yes. Uh, actually, uh, instead of chat, I think you left the chat when this happening. Um, actually, it's how Holy Spirit came into. Uh, what is the concept of Holy Ghost? And also, the other question is, what is the difference between the Trinity, with, between the Protestants and the Catholics? Okay, so uh, the, the Holy Ghost, we're going to uh, get to that now, inshallah, because that's at the very end of the, uh, the Nicio-Constantinopolitan Creed in 381. So we'll, we'll get to that, I'll answer that in a, in a minute, inshallah. As far as the differences between belief in the Trinity, um, between Protestants and Catholics, there, there are no major differences. The Protestants accept this creed. They accept the first seven, actually, ecumenical church councils. The Council of Nicaea I, Constantinople I, Ephesus after this. They accept the Council of Chalcedon. They, they accept Constantinople II, Nicaea II. Constant so the first, the first seven ecumenical councils are accepted by Protestants. Okay. Um, the differences with Protestants and Catholics, the main difference is that the Protestants do not accept a lot of the church tradition um, uh, that comes uh, after the, the, the Seventh Ecumenical Council. They don't accept the infallibility of the Pope. Um, and there are certain other um, uh, doctrines uh, that when you get down to the sort of the theological nitty gritty about sin and the nature of sin and things like that, uh, that there are differences um, uh, as well. Um, but when it comes to the Trinity, you know, I can't really think of major differences between Protestants, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox. All three of these groups, which make up, you know, 99.999% uh, of Christians all around the world. Um, I mean, there are a few Unitarian Christians as well that don't accept these creeds, but those are very, very few. All of these, all three of these groups accept these creeds. Now, regarding the Holy Spirit, um, they go on to say here, right, that uh, they go on to say that, you know, Jesus, he ascended into the heavens. He's seated at the right hand of the Father. He'll come again in glory. He'll judge the living and the dead whose kingdom has no end. And we believe in the Holy Spirit. Okay, so what is the Holy Spirit? The, the creed says the Holy Spirit is Kurian, Lord, and Zoapoyan, life giver, right? So the Holy Spirit is that which gives life to all sentient uh, beings um, and is the one pre proceeding, it says, from the Father, right? So the Holy Spirit is also also has this, this uh, essential pre-eternality as the Son. All three are equal, right? And the Holy Spirit also, it goes on to say, is co-worshipped, co-glorified, and spoke to the prophets. So this is basically, basically the role of the Holy Spirit is to give the messages of God to the prophets, according to this creed. So the primary duty of the Father is creation, creation out of nothing. That doesn't mean that the Son and Holy Spirit, according to Christians, don't participate in creation out of nothing. They do, but this is sort of the primary, like the Father sort of takes the lead um, when it comes to creation from nothing. Christians cannot say the Father created out of nothing and the Son has nothing to do with that, because then they're saying that basically the son is 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 um is essentially inferior to the father um they can't say that they have to say that the son somehow participates in the actions of the father they're inseparable in action or else they're going to be or else it's going to be two different consciousnesses and that's two different gods right so so the the major role of the father is to create the major role of the son is redemption the son comes down into human flesh and dies for the sake of uh, humanity. Um, so that's his major role. And then the major role of the Holy Spirit is sanctification, is to bring the messages of God to human beings, right? 
So the Ruhul Qudus, the Holy Spirit, according to Christians, is the third person of the Trinity um, who inspires the prophets, uh, if you will. I was raised Roman Catholic. Most Christians don't know any of this unless they're scholars. I studied because I found out Mithra was born uh, December 25th. I accepted Islam nine years ago. Oh, mashallah. Yeah, so definitely um, what we see with um, early, um, what, what we see with um, the Catholic Church in the third and fourth centuries, I would say, is a clear mirroring uh, of ancient pagan beliefs. I mean, you can go back even, as I said, as early as Paul. What Paul, I mean, Paul really set the trend there by accepting this Greco Roman uh, motif of the dying and rising savior man god, right? Um, but, um, yeah, I mean, the Vatican, the, the Vatican used to be a necropolis. It was a city of the dead. It was revered by, by Roman pagans before the advent of Christianity. Um, and so a lot of these, uh, so yeah, December 25th was the birthday, was, was the birthday of Mithras, the sun god. Uh, Constantine chose it as the birthday of Jesus, uh, because possibly he wanted to sort of facilitate, uh, easy, you know, sort of conversion process of pagans to Christianity. Uh, Dr. Ali, I have a question. I actually have two questions. Um, so based off of this kind of study of core um, Christian theology, um, is it correct to say, like, when we're talking to, like, Christians and we talk to them about, you know, religion typically has, like, the three components, like, beliefs, practices, and values, and Often they share in their values like love and generosity and all that. And some they share in their practices too, like prayer and charity. But then in terms of like the core beliefs, so the, the, the major distinctions between Christianity and Islam, obviously we believe in the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi but after that, it's the identity of Jesus that we assume full humanness to him uh, and then prophethood. Then also salvation doesn't come through crucifixion, salvation it comes through like istighfar and just following the commands of Allah. Like, so that's one question. And then my other question is, when you look at um, like just practical da'wah with Christians, like um, I remember one time in one of your lectures, you were saying that uh, there was like a study of, of churchgoers and a, a significant portion of them couldn't even name the, the four gospels. So like, so we're kind of seeing that the, the level of knowledge of their own religion is, is, is a little bit lower. What have you found to be effective da'wah with Christians? You know, like, is it getting into like the deep studies of, of uh, theology or is it kind of, like, I don't know, I just want to know about your experience. Yeah. So regarding the first question, uh, I would say, yeah, I would say a major difference in our Christology is the concept of soteriology. Like, how does one become saved, right? Um, now, if you if you go to a Christian at random that's coming out of a church that knows a thing or two about Christianity, I disconnected for a second there. Um, so I was saying that if you go to a Christian at random and ask them about how do I get saved, uh, they're going to invariably quote to you from Paul. Um, so he'll say something like, uh, in order for you to be saved, you have to believe that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, that he rose from the dead, he died for your sins, right? Um, but uh, if, you, um, if you actually go to the Gospels and, um, and uh, read the Gospels, uh, this question is posed directly to Isa, alayhi salam, according to the Christian Gospels. Now, the Christian Gospels, obviously, they're problematic from our perspective, uh, but... It's interesting that in this text, you find it in three different places, uh, Matthew 18, 18, uh, sorry, Luke 18, 18, Matthew 19, 17, Mark 10, 18, good master, what must I do to gain eternal life? How do I go to heaven? This is a question posed to Isa, alayhi salam, to Jesus, peace be upon him, according to three gospels. And his answer is, why are you calling me good? There's no one good but one, that is God. So Isa, alayhi salam, in this text doesn't even accept the title of good, because good means perfect, all right? One of the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is as-salam. And as-salam doesn't mean like the peace or something like that. As-salam comes from uh, salim, right? The one who is perfect. Why are you calling me good? There's no one good but one, and that is God. So here, Isa alayhi salam, in this text, Mark 10, 18, Luke 18, 18, Matthew 19, 17, is creating a very clear distinction between himself and God. And then he says, follow the commandments and you shall enter the life, right? Follow God's commandments. What are God's commandments? God commands us to make tawbah, very, very uh, uh, important uh, theological virtue, 
in the Hebrew Bible as well as the Quran, right? In Allah Tawabin. Allah loves the people who make Toba, right? And uh, we would say as Muslims that this is the actual teaching of Isa alayhi salam. It's not the teaching of uh, this is the, that the teaching of Paul is that is that uh, is is the idea of vicarious atonement uh, through you know blood magic uh, and things like that. But if you read the Gospels, even you know in Luke 15, you have the parable of the prodigal son. Ask a Christian. You ask me like what what are some of the things that I that that are effective in making da'wah to Christians. Well, Christians do not expect you at all to know anything about their scripture, right? Any Christian, even if they've never really studied the Bible at all, they do not expect you to know anything, right? So if you um, are able to, uh, if, if you are able to uh, use an example from their text, which confirms our theology, and you have to be good at this because you have to, and if the Christian is clever, he'll go to someplace else and say, well, over here, it says this. And that's again, and you have to have an answer for that too, right? You have to be able to deal with, with every scenario. So this takes practice, but ask a Christian, uh, you know, after you ask him, you know, how do I go to heaven? The Christian will probably say something like, except Jesus is God. He died for your sins and say, well, Jesus didn't say that in three gospels, you know, kind of stare at you with a blank look. Uh, and then say, well, what does Jesus mean in Luke 15, the parable of the prodigal son? And most Christians will not know. I mean, if they're laity, I mean, they've heard, you've probably heard the expression, the prodigal son returns, right? What does that mean? Well, what's the context? Well, Luke chapter 15, Jesus says a man has two sons. One of them stays with him. The other one goes out and he's a musrif, right? He's prodigal. He's a, he spends all his money. And he lives a life of sin. He ends up sleeping in a pig pen. And then after some time, that son, he comes home to his father. This is mentioned in Luke chapter 15. And his father sees him from a distance and they run towards each other and they hug each other. Uh, so that's the parable. What, does, what is this parable teaching? Is it teaching vicarious atonement through blood magic? Is, it, is this what he's teaching? This is a parable about Toba right? The man had two sons, this father, and the word father, right? This is a Hebraism. This is what the Jews used to call God, right? Uh, the Christians took this term and they literal, they made it literal, right? Uh, but it doesn't mean father in the literal sense. This is majaz. This is figurative language. It means rub. Ab means rub in the Hebrew Bible, right? Isaiah prays, uh, Adonai, atta avinu, Oh, Lord, you are our father, meaning our rub, right? So this man has two sons. One of them obeys him. The other one disobeys him. And then he comes back, right? Taba yatubu means to turn around, to reorient yourself. It's the same word in Hebrew. Teshuva means to reorient yourself towards God. He turns around towards the father, his father, meaning the rub. So this father is sort of an analogy for God. And he repents to his father, and his father accepts him. This is the teaching of Isa alayhi salam. It's about repentance. And then what about the second part of that question about your own practical experience in doing da'wah with Christians? What have you found to be effective? Um, I think just having, um, just having like adab with people and, uh, you know, not losing your temper. People, people tend to remember, you know, people's attitudes and how they sort of felt at the moment of an interaction, you know. Um, so, uh, and you might say that's good or bad, but, um, that's usually what people remember. So I think, uh, I think sometimes if you're, if you're actually having a discussion with a Christian and, um, they're getting sort of riled up a little bit, I think at that point we sort of have to make a decision. Do I really want to win this argument or do I just want to sort of show good character, right? Uh, and, and, uh, just be polite, um, and uh, just just put your point across, obviously. So, I mean, the best advice is the advice we find in the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, hasana. So I try to live by this, you know, call people to the way of Allah, meaning to the deen of Islam, with wisdom. And the ulama here, the exegetes, they say that this means 
with int intellectual and academic dala'il, proofs. You have to know your stuff. You have to do your homework, right? It's not all just charisma. There's some people who can sort of schmooze their way through life because they have a lot of charisma. But when you actually get down to the nitty gritty of what they actually know, they don't know much at all. So here the Quran is saying you have to have wisdom. You have to have academic sophistication. So you have to know what your text says. You have to know how people are interpreting our text. Know what their text says. You have to, you have to sort of deal with scenarios as they might come up. Well, uh, this is the second part. And with beautiful exhortation, and the ulama say here, the meaning of this is with a good sort of good attitude, right? With adab. Uh, and debate with them. And the word here is debate. Jidal is debate, right? People don't like that word for some reason. But, you know, jidal is with the Ahlul Kitab, it's with the Mushrikeen, right? Um, Muslims shouldn't be debating each other uh, because we're, if you're Sunni, you're, the, the differences are negligible. They're not a big deal. They're not, I mean, some of these discussions are just, they, they don't ha have no practical application in the world today. These old theological debates um, uh, were united upon. And it's incredible, the miracle that happened in our tradition. We never had a single council, ecumenical council, right? Uh, yet you have this incredible uh, cohesiveness uh, in our theology. Of course, there are differences, but again, they're minor, they're neg negligible. So a debate is with Ahlid Kitab. A debate with them in ways that are good, in ways that are beautiful, right? Uh, so it's a beautiful ayah. This is ayah number one, uh, I believe 120 of Surah Al-Nahal, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so that's that's what I try. That's what I find to be effective. Uh, and Sallallahu Alaihi I mean, I, this is something that I can testify is true. Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala says it in the Quran, and I found it to be true. Is that when you have academic sophistication and you also have good comportment, right? And those are working together because there are some people who are very very sharp intellectually, but they have bad bad adab. And you might destroy a Christian in a debate and just like wipe your feet on him. And then this Christian will rise up and he will do some serious homework because he won't forget that humiliation. He might even dedicate his life to destroying Islam after that. And I've actually seen people like that. I've seen this happen. Um, or you might have the opposite. You might have someone, again, who's very charismatic or he's very humble person, right? Very good attitude, but just doesn't know anything when it comes to, when it comes to academics, when it comes to apologetics. When it comes to textual studies, when it comes to logha, to, to the language, when it comes to sharia, when it comes to, you know, theology. Uh, and so this person will go and try to, you know, present good character. And that's the extent of what he should do. Everyone should know their limitations, right? If you have good character, show good character, but don't try to engage in a theological debate, you know, with somebody um, and then end up losing. And then that person feels emboldened because they oh, I just destroyed this Muslim in a debate. Obviously, his theology is false. And. You know, obviously, he couldn't answer simple things about how Jesus is God. How Jesus must be God, and things like that. Um, so that's that's sort of the approach. Is uh, is in, and you know, it's it's difficult sometimes. If if you're dealing with very very emotional Christians, I would just not even waste my time. I would just make du'a for them. It, it's uh, you know, the kind of Christian that you know kind of gets a megaphone and starts shouting at you and. Uh, th there are there are people like that that come to college campuses. I wouldn't even engage with them, and these and they're sort of trained to, to um, you know, they 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 sort of throw something out there, and they want you to respond to something so they can because they have this sort of response that they want everyone to hear, right? Um, so their tactic is really one of humiliation. But Christians that are you know they're they're sincere and you know them and. Or they have genuine questions, engage with them with, with wisdom and beautiful exhortation.